Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Ryan. This is Grant for another episode of Grant Teach Me Something. So one thing about Grant's Teach Me Something is, is about getting creative and getting out of the, the wholesaling, flipping, rental type of mindset. And I think one of the things we're going to talk about today, wraps, you always kind of hear it as a throwaway. It's like, oh, I'll just wrap it. Oh, I'll just wrap it. Well, I would think most of us are kind of like, what the hell is a wrap? Because... <laughs> A, maybe we've never taught, because it is a creative type of right. thing, and B, it's it's a little bit harder to kind of teach versus, and you know, I don't know. Wh right. What's so difficult about it? Well, or so what is it actually? when you rap, you have to, <clears throat> it's really hard because you have internal rhyming schemes and you've got external rhyming schemes. And so when you create these phrases, you ha I'm sorry, I'm talking about a different kind of rap, sorry. Um, no, rap mortgages, ha, I'm a funny guy. Rap mortgages. <laughs> <laughs> when you and that's have our a episode. payment, have a great yeah, day. da 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 da. da. Um, rap mortgages are when you have a payment underneath to debt. Okay, you've got a you've got a first lien on your property somehow. That could be because you bought your property subject to. That could be because you bought your property with financing from a bank. It doesn't really matter. You've got debt on a property. Okay, mm -hmm. let's say that that debt for the property is. $400 a, uh, a month, like we talked about uh, in the previous two weeks. I'm gonna kind of use those similar numbers. Let's say it's $400 a month that you're paying to the bank. Mm -hmm. To wrap that mortgage means that you're going to take that debt and wrap new debt around it, which essentially, when you boil it down, as simply means your buyer's gonna pay you more than you're paying on a monthly basis. Okay. Okay. So their payment may be $750 a month, your payment is $400 a month. You may be paying $80,000 worth of principal. They may be paying $90,000 worth so of principal. So if I were going to visualize this, and forgive me if this throws a curveball <laughs> and messes everybody's heads up, but say, okay, this is the underlying debt on yeah. the, the lien, the mortgage, or whatever one it is. Mm -hmm. if that's the debt. And this is the buyer coming in to like overdo that. Yes. But it's not going to be here. It's going to be more like here. And that space between is your... That's your equity. equity that's your how profit, that's your cash, your revenue, flow, cash flow. Yeah, all that kind okay. of stuff, right? So yeah, I mean, I like that visualization because that's typically how I or draw it out. Better be like, here's the debt. No, open oh. your hand. <laughs> that's that's you. That's your money. Okay, yeah. And that's the buyer, right? Oh, yeah. And I just like that we're no, holding no, hands. No, I mean, serious. Like, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh -huh. this hand here, that's the money right. in between. Okay. Right. Now, yeah. I, I'm a visual guy. If you're a visual guy, maybe that helps. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and a, I wasn't trying to be stupid. It's a good visualization. It really is. Because that is exactly what's happening is you've got debt that you can't change. You've got debt if you bought a house subject to, and again, you know, referencing subject to here, uh, if you're interested in sub two, we did an actual grant teach me something on sub two, episode six. So just go through the Propelio live uh, There's videos. There's a playlist. There's a playlist for Grant Teach Me Something. Look at episode six and you can learn more about uh, sub two there. But, but essentially sub two is taking over on somebody's payments. Okay. Is what it boils down to. You can't change those payments. You know, that payment to Wells Fargo, that payment to Bank of America, that is what it is, right? So again, you may be owing uh, $70,000 at four and a quarter percent you know, $400 a month for 22 more years. And that's your, that's your chunk right here. Mm -hmm. You can't change that. Right. What we're going to do is we've got a first lien to Wells Fargo here, and then we're going to sell it to our buyer, who's then going to pay us more money on a monthly basis, kind of wrapping around that. And that's where we make our money. Okay. This is a way to, uh, um, uh, sell the property, okay? I don't want you to use a wrap to purchase a property, just like I don't want you to use a sub two to sell a property, okay? What, what was the statement we brought up last week, or, or maybe it wasn't you, maybe it was one of their guests, but it's like, uh, um, shit, how'd it go? It was like, the strategy used to buy it, don't use the same strategy to sell it. Uh, that would have been somebody else. I don't remember what that. Oh, damn it. <laughs> It was really good. It was super it was impactful. So good. It might be. It might have been Dan Diaz. Uh, oh, when he was okay. In here. Gotcha. Uh, but basically, he was saying if you're going to sub two to purchase or uh -huh. owner finance purchase, uh -huh. you don't want to owner finance sell it. You want to yeah. like cash it out or whatnot. Well, okay. So I'm. So I wouldn't necessarily agree with that particular way of Whoops. saying it. I didn't mean to like no, 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 no. no. But th but it's a good thing for us to talk about because. Uh, Owner financing, we talk a lot about seller financing, owner financing. Seller financing, owner financing, same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. They're interchangeable. If you hear me say one over the other, we're talking about the same thing. We talk about seller financing a lot, okay? Creative ways of acquiring, creative ways of selling. If I'm buying with owner financing, I'm selling with owner financing mm -hmm. because I have my debt lined up for me. Right. Because guys, how hard, I mean, raise your hand virtually if you can go out and get debt at 4% on a 22, 25 year note from your commercial line 
mm -hmm. you know, with your bank. It's not going to happen. In, in full disclaimer, I am an idiot, so I could have <laughs> butchered his thing. So, Dan, if you're uh, watching or could somebody tag Dan uh, to come in and, 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 correct, and us. correct me on yeah. my thought process or what? Because it was a great quote. And, uh, again, I, I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure <laughs> I butchered it. That's fine. But it's good because it brings up the thought process that, that I'm we want to talk about. Yeah, yeah no, that's what I want to talk about is how idiotic. So if I'm buying with seller financing, I'm, seller, or I'm selling with seller financing typically because mm -hmm. I've got that debt lined up, which allows me the long-term uh, hold option. But I do sometimes, like I've got a house that's, uh, you know, I'd, I've got it under contract. It should be closing in a couple of weeks that I bought sub two from a wholesaler where there was just no equity in the deal. They didn't have enough room to make it into a wholesale deal. So they sent me the lead. I closed on it subject to, I put in the $10,000 it needed in repairs and I threw it up on the retail market because I was able to buy it subject to, and I didn't have that debt obligation of the, of the large chunk of money. Right. It made sense. I'm going to, I'm going to turn a, you know, $30,000 profit, 25 to $30,000 profit on that. And really the only cash I'm coming out of pocket was the rehab for 10 grand because mm -hmm. I was able to purchase subject to. So the reason I'm saying these two different examples is that I want to be very clear that owner financing, seller financing is an umbrella term. There's multiple strategies within that term. Subject to is one form of seller financing. And subject to is an acquisition model. That is how you're going to acquire your properties. Do not sell your property with sub two because you'll be leaving a lot of money on the table. Right. And, and I'm glad you brought that uh, all that up and, and not to get too far off the rails mm -hmm. of, of wraps and, and going into that strategy is too often in the real estate investor game, it's I'm a real estate investor and there's so many damn strategies out there. Yeah. And yes, you can know a lot, but you really need to find some sort of niche. And yes, you could dabble in other right. strategies, but try to be an expert in that niche. Right, yeah, and I do encourage that because it's, you know, one of the things is that I, I always talk about you should have a bat belt, you should have all the different tools available to you so that you can, if you have a deal that's a great wholesale, wholesale it, make your money. If you've got a deal that's a great right. fix and flip, fix and flip it, make your money. But for instance, like that property I'm talking about down in DeSoto, if I didn't know how to do a fix and flip and subject to, then I wouldn't know how to mix those two strategies right. and make the most out of that opportunity. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm encouraging you guys to look at it, knowing these different strategies. So when we get back to that, we've got seller financing. Subject to is one form of seller financing and it's an acquisition model. However, what I want you guys to, to understand is that wraparounds is another form of seller financing and it is a disposition model. It's the way for you to actually make money on the deal once you've purchased it subject to, once you've purchased it with seller financing, or even if you just had that property as a rental and you want to turn around and seller finance it to somebody else, this is how you make money in, in seller financing. It's through the wraparound mortgage, mm -hmm. okay? Now, there's a lot of cool things about the wraparound mortgage. Those of you who watched uh, this whole series, I think it was episode one, we were doing the two LLC system, right? I, I briefly, <laughs> why don't you remember? I, I briefly mentioned that there's multiple reasons why that two LLC system is gonna be beneficial to you. Not only being able to foreclose on yourself, but things like uh, uh, interest rates and that are, are benefits from doing the two LLC mm -hmm. system. And now we'll kind of dive into a little bit of what I mean by that. And, and, and real quick, because you didn't mention that, I will throw a slight you know, plug. Uh, Watching these videos, doing these videos with Grant, mm -hmm. like even in my common, you know, conversation, and, and I'm and I'm up here and I'm kind of paying attention, or I'm trying to pay attention, <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of funny because I learn shit here too. So if you if this is your first video, I highly recommend just go into the playlist, watch one, go to two, three, four, and I think this is episode ten. But you will learn something. You will learn how to real estate and do the sub twos, the wraps, hopefully yeah. today. Right. Um, if we can get to it, if I can't keep derailing us. <laughs> but it, but my point being is, even in my vernacular, I'm, I bring up, I'm like, I learned that with Grant. The <laughs> Good. LLC system. Exactly. So anyway, yeah. back to wraps. So I'm glad, because I, I, I do encourage you guys. There's a lot of information out there. So the two LLC system is one of those things where even if you own a house free and clear, um, you may want to create debt on that property in order to wrap the mortgage to your end buyer, okay? So let's move over to the whiteboard real quick if we can. And, and I'm gonna while start we're using walking, some, uh -oh. please like, please share, please ask your questions because, because Grant is so brainy, he does get meaty very quickly. So if you need him <laughs> to slow down, please let us know to slow down. Uh, if you have questions, drop them in the comments. 
Uh, if you're liking what you're seeing, please give us some likes. Please give us some loves. Yes. Uh, that's our early pitch to help us out here at Propelio. Right. And, and he's right on point, too. Is I, It's really important to me that I do keep this meaty, that I do keep actual information in front of you guys, but it's really important to me that we're not moving too quickly. And when I'm speaking live in front of a group of people, it's really easy to kind of judge how everybody's following. In a, in a digital form like the this, eyes just go, <laughs> right, they're like, what is it? You get that little dog, like the one like ear up. Um, but please, raise your hand, comment, ask questions. Uh, um, oh, you know, we've got one question here we'll get to here in just a second, and I, I encourage those. I want those. So let's look at what we're talking about here with wraparounds and how the, the two LLC system might work with that. And just to give us a visual of what we were doing with our beautiful hand holding, over here is our initial debt that we may have at 70,000 for 22 years, and it's going to be 406 uh, a month. Okay, that's going to be the debt that we're taking over on subject two or that we purchased with a bank loan or whatever that might be. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sell it with owner financing to somebody for a larger purchase price. So they're going to buy it for $100,000. They're going to have a 30 year note on it and they're going to be paying us $756 a month. Okay, we're charging nine and a half percent on this. We're typically at like four and a quarter on our underlying debt. If you'll notice, each number on the underlying debt has been increased whenever we sell it to our buyer. That's how we're making our money, okay? One of the benefits to having a wraparound, one of the benefits to doing this model right here, and the fact that this is technically going to be in a second lien position, which we'll talk about here in just a second, is that because of the compliance, because of Dodd-Frank and those other kind of lending laws that we need to be aware of, you're actually able to charge more money for that deal than if you were to just outright sell them a house with owner financing. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, let's imagine that you've got a house and you've had a house that's a rental and you've had that rental for 25, 30 years, whatever. You've got it all paid off, it's free and clear. And you decide that you now, instead of holding the house as a rental, you want to become a, 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 a seller financed mortgagee Mortgage, yeah, mortgage G for, uh, for somebody on that. And you want to sell it to them with seller financing. If you took that free and clear property and you sold with seller financing to a buyer, that would not be a wrap. Why not? Because there's no debt. You're not actually wrapping around anything. It's free and clear. So when you sell it to that end buyer, that end buyer is in fact getting a first lien position on the property. So who can tell me what creates a lien position on a property? This is really important to understand. What creates lien position on uh, properties in real estate? Ryan, can you tell me what defines lien position? Uh, who who uh, forecloses first? Who, who raises their hand and said, me? <laughs> Whoever files first. That one. Yeah, that one. I, I got he it. Got, yes. he, you got there. You were there. Whoever files first. The only thing that matters in lien positions is the time and date in which it was filed. Okay, now lien position is important because of like what he mentioned. In a lien situation, foreclosures are what we need to be aware of. First liens get the primary focus of a foreclosure. If you foreclose as a first lien, you don't have to worry about anything. If you have a second lien position and you foreclose, you still have to worry about the first lien position. If you've got a third lien, you still have to worry about liens two and one. Okay, and by worry, we can go into that a little bit more if you guys have questions on it, but uh, but that's not necessarily the, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just say I filled in some details. I noticed that. You got so, very. So this is the wrap donut. I'm mm. going to make a new thing. It's not. So it'll correct me if I'm wrong because I am an idiot. That's the debt. Mm -hmm. That's the owner finance sell. Mm -hmm. And this is the meat in between. And that's what you get. This so you, is your profit. Exactly. That's, the, that's the, what you're getting in. That's what you're paying out. And that's what you're taking home. Exactly. So you're there paying you $756, you're paying the bank $406, you're bringing home $350 a month. In the wrap donut. In the wrap. You're going to coin this phrase and somebody's yeah. going to go out and talk to other investors. <laughs> yeah, I like wrap donuts. And you're like, you're like, what the heck what are you the, even talking about? Wrap donut. Uh, it's like, the, just start using hashtag wrap donut. The, the other thing to think about too. Hashtag wrap donut. Is you actually have equity in this deal. In this example in that we're. Hashtag wrap. Oh, in sorry. Your, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> So we sold for $100,000. Now, when you sell with a wrap around mortgage, the going uh, terms are actually going to be like a 10% down payment 
and then you're gonna give your buyer nine and a half percent for 30 years. That's basically what the, the going rate is these days on a wraparound mortgage. But what that means is you sell it to them for $100,000, you get $10,000 right from day one. For the down payment. For the down payment. So those of you wholesalers out there, those of you, we already got some people wrap donutting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those of you wholesalers, those of you fix and flippers that are out there, you know, wholesalers are typically bringing home an average. If you're good, honestly, if you're good, you're making like 10 grand, an average of the wholesale. Wholesale deals are a little bit harder these days. Well, you can make 10 grand up front on a wraparound mortgage and still have $350 a month coming to you in monthly cash flow. And on top of that, if you sell it for $100,000 and you take a $10,000 down payment, what is their mortgage for to you? $90,000. $90,000. I do math in my <laughs> hashtag rap donuts. In his rap, rap donuts. Sorry. Okay, I said last time that was my So, life. So what happens is now you've got a buyer that owes you 90 and you owe 70. So you've got $20,000 worth of equity in this deal as well. Okay? Because you owe 70, they owe you 90. You got 20 grand sitting there as a nest egg. You're making 350 a month and you got $10,000 up front. Now I'll be real, whenever you sell this property, you're typically gonna use a realtor to help you sell it. And you're typically gonna pay that realtor 3% for bringing you a buyer. Well, in this case, that would be 3,000 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So you're still gonna net $7,000 from your down payment. Because if you get 10,000 and you need to pay three of that to a realtor, right. you're getting seven to take home. So this is why this is such an awesome strategy for those of you who are doing wholesaling or fix and flipping or whatever, is because you can still get that cash up front and you can still get that cash flow and it's a nice meld between whereas landlords say, well, I want the long-term cash flow, that's why I'm doing landlording. And wholesalers say, well, I need the capital now, that's why I'm doing capital, or that's why I'm doing wholesaling. With a, a wraparound mortgage, you're getting the best of all worlds. You're getting not only the cash flow that you would look for in a rental, but you're also getting that upfront cash. And oh, by the way, when you hold a mortgage to somebody, you're not responsible for the taxes, the insurance, the repairs, the AC, the whatever. The joke I always make is that, again, I'll make you digitally raise your hand here. If you, if you have a mortgage on your house, raise your hand. Comment if you've got a mortgage on your house. And I want you to keep your digital hand raised. Oh, you know what? There's a like button. I'm going to make, if you've got a mortgage on your house, do a thumbs up, right? Do another thumbs up if you've ever called that mortgage company and told them that your toilet was leaking. Your, your, your mortgage company doesn't give a crap. We're going to get zero likes. No, so do, an, uh, do a heart if you've never called your mortgage. Yeah, what the, sh what the hell, man? <laughs> you know how to Facebook? I don't. I don't know how to Facebook. I, it, it, but okay. but yeah. the thing is, is that the mortgage company doesn't give a crap about your leaky faucet. The mortgage company doesn't care about your leaky toilet or the fact right. that your door isn't shutting right. And we are becoming the mortgage company in this. We are the ones that are collecting every first of the month and if they don't pay us, we just foreclose on them and we get the house back. Right. We're not talking about trying to go in there and, and have to repair things and deal with the vacancy of tenants and have a one year lease and hope that they renew and yeah, okay, you can raise the rent and that kind of stuff. But when you do this, you've got a 30 year commitment from your buyer of cash flow coming in at 350 and that's a net cash flow. And, and one thing I know you, you, you most like get to it, but I'll lead you into it just in case you forget. Here's one thing because it's written real small, 22 years, 30 years. So our hashtag wrap donut eventually becomes a hashtag wrap donut hole? No, because the donut hole is gone. So it becomes one pizza. Of, donut, <laughs> have pizza. It's a wrap pizza. Oh my gosh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but the cool thing about that, and for those of you who watched my Road to Retirement series that we just did the last two weeks on, uh, you'll you'll understand the benefit to that. We got a wrap pizza comment now coming up. Um, <laughs> You'll understand the benefit to that is that in 22 years, you're no longer paying 406 a month to your debt. So now you actually have uh, another $406 added to your cash flow and you're making a full 756 cash flow for 30 years. I'm going to do some quick math for you on this number, on this deal right here to show you exactly what kind of money we're talking about making on a wraparound mortgage and why that is so uh, beneficial to us, right? So if we've got a $70,000 mortgage at uh, four and a quarter percent at 22 years, that'd be 408.59, pretty close to what we're talking about here. Now, here's the number that I want you guys to remember. How many years? 22. Here's the number I want you guys to remember. With interest included, everything included in this deal, if you pay that out for the next 22 years, you're gonna pay 107,867. 
107,867. That's 70,000 at four and a quarter for 22 years, 867. 5309. Um, so if we look at the wrap mortgage here, oops. I'm going to erase this because I'm sure people get it. Yeah, they get that point now. And you're doing $90,000 mortgage to your buyer for 30 years at 9.5%. You said 90. 90K for 30 years. Uh, yeah, but you said 9%. Oh, 9.5% for 30 years. The payment coming in to you would be 756. And all in all, they're going to pay you $272,000. $437. So if you take 272,470 and subtract 107,867, on this one asset where you started out only having a difference of uh, $20,000 spread or really $30,000 spread in the equity, you're turning that into 164,603. So basically, you're turning that asset into $165,000 net profit off of one single asset that you don't have any responsibilities to anymore versus like, like I said, the rental where you've got to do the repairs, you've got to pay for the taxes, you've got to pay for the insurance and the wraparound mortgage. That's not your responsibility. You're bringing home $165,000. Now, granted, I'm assuming that you're going to full term with the 22 years here and you're going to full term with the 30 years there. But I will tell you that surprisingly enough, it's actually more common for that to be the case uh, for somebody, your, your buyer, to actually pay you the full 20 or 30 year term mm -hmm. in a wraparound mortgage. Whereas those of us who are watching this video, you're probably more used to moving every five to seven years. You might get a new mortgage and that kind of stuff. So you're thinking, well, people sell their house after five to seven years. Not in the wrap mortgage world, not in the owner financing world. It's more common that people stay in that note for quite a while. So you can somewhat count on this coming in. And that's one of the cool things about that wraparound. Can I curveball? Please do. Um, and because you have the note, I know a lot of people are like, man, 30 year commitment. Yeah, right. that's a 30 year commitment to them. And yeah, I only have a 22 commitment. 10 years, maybe I need to liquidate. Yeah. What do you do? So the cool thing about that, let's erase this and we're gonna, we're gonna demonstrate something that we, that we touched on a little bit so last real week. Real quick, did y'all learn all that? Is that a simple concept other than the fact that Ryan's hungry now? talking about donuts and pizzas. <laughs> right, we've got people saying this isn't gonna help their, uh, their, their keto diet. And then <laughs> Thomas popped in and said donuts are keto because they're nuts. I mean, the logic sound, right? It makes sense. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we touched on last week's lesson. Did, did we have any questions? Oh, about yeah, that please. Aspect of it yet? The basic. Please pop it? up some questions and let's look through here. You know, I got some questions here. We got some questions. Oh, we got questions on the way. Uh, so while Daniel's running over there to get those asked uh, so we could kind of join the conversation, uh, please like, please share. If you have questions, jump in. If you want to comment how fat I am, you know what? <laughs> Screw you too. With love. Donuts, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I can't get enough of this. So um, from Russian Jaime, I've got a question here. <laughs> Russian is, Jaime. His name's Jaime, right? It is Jaime, Because yeah. I don't know how to say yeah. the, that stuff. He's a cool guy. He knows a lot. So is it any safer to acquire sub two into a trust or into your LLC? If into a trust, do you initially put the seller as beneficiary and then assign their interest to your LLC? That's a really good question. Okay, so one of the common things that you will hear referred to when we're talking about owner financing and subject to is you're gonna hear gurus around the country saying, just put it into a trust and everything's gonna be okay. Don't worry about it, just put it into a trust. And I'm gonna be very frank with you guys. If you have questions about how a trust works, raise your hand by putting that thumb up there, right? I'm going to guarantee, almost guarantee, oh, wait, sorry. that every one of you out there is going to give us a thumbs up right now because you've got a question about how trusts work because they don't, you don't necessarily understand exactly how trusts work. And that's what those guys are capitalizing on. Those guys are counting on the fact that trusts are this like exotic thing that not everybody fully understands and therefore they have something that you want to buy from them because you need that knowledge. Right, so they're counting on you not understand. So yeah, we've got a lot of thumbs up coming. Yeah, because I was gonna say before you answer the question, can you explain the question? Right, right, because and that's I'm stupid. and I'm going to, but that's but to <laughs> preface it, I wanted you guys to understand that this is why you hear it so commonly because the people who are gonna out, be out there preaching, oh, just put it into a trust and everything will be fine, will probably be asking you to pay for their program within the next three hours. Okay, so be very aware of that when you hear that come up. 
trusts, uh, the, way, the, the, the basis of this question is the fact that in 1985 or 1986, something like that, there was a, there was a, a law passed called the Garn St. Germain Act, okay? The Garn St. Germain Act says that if you put a house into a trust, Garn, G-A-R-N, no, G-A-R-N, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you put a house into an estate planning trust, that does not violate something called the due on sale clause. Okay, the due on sale clause is something that all subject to people that are buying sub two want to avoid, and we'll talk about due on sale clause here in just a second, uh, briefly. But for more, look into the subject two video we did on episode six. If you put your house into an estate planning trust, you deed that house into an estate planning trust, that does not violate the due on sale clause. The due on sale clause says that when a deed is <laughs> transferred uh, or any interest of that deed is transferred, the bank has the option, not the obligation, but the option to ask for the rest of their money to be called, to be paid off, okay? That's the due on sale clause. So when we're doing a subject two deal, we're absolutely triggering the due on sale clause. We are buying that property, the deed is transferring, therefore the due on sale clause is being triggered. It's not a violation of the due on sale clause, it's a trigger of the due on sale clause. My office has seen over 15,000 deals happen in the last 30 years with owner financing, and of those, we've seen fewer than 10 due on sale clauses ever get called. It's very unlikely in the real world that due on sale is actually going to be called, but it can be. But disclaimer on that, when, you, when you're, uh, not to get in the weeds, but when you're calling the bank and, and saying, hey, I'm, I'm the new power of attorney, I'm managing this fund, you're not flat out saying, oh, by the way, this is now deeded to me. <laughs> and don't right. do that. We do I've, never, I've never done that ever. <laughs> we do want to... Uh, give all of the pertinent information in conversations with the bank. But not. We don't want to dangle it in front of them. Our, you know, we don't want, that is a good, we don't want to just dangle it in front of them and say, please call the due on sale clause. Right. I'm going to handcuff you and say, because if you get it too obvious to them, then yes, they're going to have to call it. But we give them their pertinent information. The bank, at the end of the day, what does the bank want? You guys tell me, what does the bank want? What, if they have a mortgage their on their house, you comment right now, what do you think that the bank wants from you? A wrap donut. I mean, uh, they want your. They want money. They want money. Money. They want their payments. They don't want their property. Okay. So they're they're looking for interest. They're looking for payments. They're looking for money. If they wanted property, they'd be called Caldwell Banker. They wouldn't be called Bank of America. They don't want your soul, Daniel. They want your money. Which you know, depending on who you are, that might be your soul. But we're we're derailing here. Here the point. The point is the question from Jaime. <laughs> yeah. What was the question? <laughs> is trusts and and understanding why that's a question. You've got to got to go through several things. So uh, so. People will say, just put it into your trust. It's not, going to, uh, it's not going to violate the due on sale clause. It's not going to trigger the due on sale clause if you put it into a trust. They're using Garn St. Germain as their basis of, of conversation for that. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that putting a house into a trust so that an investor can buy it from you is an estate planning trust? It's probably a trust that's going to benefit the investor. It's, yeah, it's not an estate planning trust. The intent of the law when it came out was for people to be able to put a house into a trust and pass it to their children. Right. Right. And to be able to have that as a way to, to estate planning, right? Uh, by us putting it into a trust for this, it's not actually applicable to Garn St. Germain Act. So it is not actually going to save you from the due on sale clause. The bank has every right to still call that note due even if you buy it sub two into a trust. Now, does a trust add an extra little veil to your transaction that might help you uh, from getting that due on sale clause called? Sure, okay? Now, I'll put it this way. Out of my entire portfolio of houses that I buy sub two, and it, like I said, when I buy sub two, I sell with a wrap because I've already got my mortgage uh, funding lined up for me there. When I do that, I'm not using a trust in these. Typically, in my office, nobody is using trusts for these because typically and historically speaking, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how the future is going to go, but historically speaking, we don't have an issue with uh, due on sale being called through LLCs when it's done the right way. Now to answer the second part of your question, Jaime, yes, everything I'm doing is in my LLC. That's one of the beautiful parts about subject two and wraparounds and owner financing is that I don't have to sit in front of a bank and sign my name with my debt onto these loans. This is non-recourse, unlimited, non-institutionalized money. And we put that into our LLCs and our liability is dang near zero if we're doing things the right way that way. So we've got parts of that issue. Now, what I will say, I bought my personal residence that I live in subject to. I put it into a trust, okay? 
because I wanted that extra little help of veil between that subject to and the due on sale clause being called. However, when you're typically wrapping the, the financial acumen, I guess, I don't know, the, 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 the financial intelligence of somebody buying a wraparound mortgage is not going to be matching yours, okay? You are studying these numbers every day and you're understanding how the real estate works. They're not. When you start trying to tell a buyer, well, guess what? You're gonna give me $10,000, you're gonna give me $756 a month, and you actually don't own the property, but you own the thing that owns the property. It gets a little bit more confusing for them, and that can cause some like, I've seen people kind of get a little bit nervous about it on that side. So that's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. we don't go about it that way. The last part of Jaime's question is a very involved question. I'm Dear sorry. Dear Lord, good I, question. Well, it was, it was a, it's a very involved question. The last part of his question was, are you putting the beneficiary interest of the trust into the seller's name initially? The way that a trust works is it's basically like an LLC. It's just an entity. It's a, it's a package held and it, and it can own uh, uh, assets. The person that gets the benefit of those assets or is kind of like the equivalent of the owner of an LLC. And that's gonna be the beneficiary of that, L, uh, of that trust, okay? Um, so what happens when we buy houses into a trust is we'll put the house into the trust so that the trust becomes the owner of the property. The bank is only ever gonna see that the trust is the owner of the property. And then, yes, initially the beneficial interest, or the beneficiary, but the beneficial interest is the seller's name. And immediately upon closing, that seller is going to sign a, a, uh, 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 an assignment of beneficial interest from them to you. So now you own the trust, the trust owns the property, the bank only ever sees the trust, the documents that transfer that trust ownership from seller to you are private, those don't have to be publicly filed. So in order for the bank to dive in and see that the beneficial interest has changed, they would have to have a court order and it would make things more difficult. But again, to bring it all back together, that does not keep you from getting away from the due on sale clause. It just adds some added little steps in between them getting to you through the due on sale clause. <gasps> Take a break. And you know, before we get to the next question, I do just want to address something. Neither myself, Daniel, or Grant are a lawyer. You know who is or an attorney, Matthew Acock. Matthew Acock, who is coming in on Friday. <laughs> so this is for entertainment purposes and advice, but we are not financial planners. We're Got not it. your attorney. So everything he just rattled off for the last hour and a half, <laughs> consult your attorney, consult your CPA. Right. And, and you know, for the record, uh, Matt Acock is coming in on, uh, Friday. on Friday. Uh, that deal that I was referring to earlier that I took over sub two and I'm selling retail, it's closing at Matt's office uh, next week. I like the guy. He really knows what he's talking about. So reach out to him. Watch that video on Friday. The dude's really sharp. So, so go with that. Mr. Moore. What other some questions do All we have? All right. I got a good question uh -oh. here. I I'm curious. My last good question took 40 is, minutes, man. <laughs> I, I, I like this question and I like, I like the responses that I, I've seen in the past. So uh -oh. I've got a question here from Tracy and her, at, her question is, how do you teach the seller to not call the bank and say stupid shit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny, I don't see that question, but that's, that's brilliant. And I love that she's so blunt about it. Because that's a problem. It is a problem. So one of the issues, so, all right, we've had, we've, <laughs> yeah, Richard, can you say all that again? What was that? Yeah, rewind, Richard, thanks a lot. Um, the, Give me some meat. <laughs> can I have some meat, please? Can you actually teach me something? Uh, <laughs> One of the problems with doing subject two is we can't control stupid sellers, okay? You can't control stupid. That's one thing. If anybody has ever watched Cops, you understand you can't control stupid, okay? <laughs> now, of those due on sale clauses that I talked about having been called, uh, like we said, there's been fewer than 10. One of those was a pissed off ex-wife that called the bank and said, I don't care that it's gonna screw up my, uh, my credit. I want it to screw up my husband's credit. Guess what he did? And they got the due on sale clause and it foreclosed on the property and all that kind of stuff. That was not my property, but it was something that I've heard of uh, happening to somebody else. When I am talking to a seller, it's very important how you speak to your seller. It's very important the words and the phrases that you use. And this is one of the things that I teach, I'll give a subtle plug. One of the things that I teach to my students, I do do training, I do personal mentoring. I've got the, the creativecashflow.com academy that you can check out. Um, and that's one of the things that we really focus on is because whenever I contract a house, when I contract it, I'm getting a power of attorney and I'm telling the seller, you don't ever need to talk to the bank again. 
this is my problem now. Everything that's gonna happen with them, if you get communication from the bank, let me know. But what I'm gonna do when I get that power of attorney, we're gonna get a power of attorney, we're gonna get an authorization to release information. We're gonna file those with the bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, whoever. The next step we're going to do is we're gonna go in and we're gonna change the mailing address to our office address. We're gonna change the contact number to our office's contact number. And we will be the people who are managing the property whenever we get spoken to from the bank. So my pitch to the seller, the benefit to the seller is that once you close with me, once you sign all this paperwork, you get to wipe your hands clean and never have to worry about this again. That's my, my job is now to take care of this stuff. If anybody ever contacts you, reach out to me. If you need something from the bank, let me know because I know the right words and I know how to speak to the bank in a way that's going to get this working in our favor. And I don't have sellers calling the bank and saying stupid stuff because of that. So it's a really good question. So, but if you do have crazy, you do have stupid, is it just, well, shit, that sucks? <laughs> yeah, it, it can be. It depends on what they say, you know? Mm. And, and inherent to any investment, there's risk. Inherent to any investment, there's going to be stuff that can go wrong in it. And if anybody makes you believe otherwise, watch out because in three hours, they're going to ask you to buy their program. Nine, nine, seven, <laughs> but, but only for you today because I like you. And that's today not how it goes. The next three, 30 minutes, two, nine, seven. Do we have any other questions? I do have some questions on I love that, that. And that is, yeah, that's if everything goes great. Yeah, they, they don't call the bank. Yes, I took over the power of attorney. Yes, I got the authorization. Yes, I transferred all of the information over to me. But what about that crazy ex-wife that calls up the bank and is just like, I want to screw up my credit. I want to screw right. up his credit. I want this to go downhill. What's your reaction going to be? On me, please. Here's the cool thing about having something like this is that what you've done with a wraparound mortgage is you've created a performing asset. And people like performing assets. And what you're able to do is you're able to uh, uh, use private money to refinance yourself out of bad situations as long as you're buying right and getting into a good situation in the first place and doing the things like we teach you to do and doing the paperwork the right way, that kind of stuff. So I've had one house in my entire portfolio that may have been a due on sale clause calling. And I don't know, excuse me, I don't know because I couldn't get anybody from the bank to actually talk to me. They just stopped accepting my payments after a couple of, of months of sending checks and them not getting cashed, we called, it was Wells. They wouldn't talk to us anymore. I couldn't get a hold of the seller. I didn't know what was going on. So what I did is I went to one of my private money people and, and this will be another opportunity for you guys out there that are watching. I mean, there are great investors like Daniel. There are people out there like myself who can place capital if you're trying to get capital out on the market. A lot of how we buy comes from that. So reach out to us. If that's, if that's you, but what I did- I think the saying is good money always finds a good deal. Yeah, or something like that. yeah, yeah, good money chases good money, right? Um, so what I did with that deal is I said, look, I'm tired of this, I'm not even gonna mess with it. I called up one of my private lenders and I said, look, I've got this deal, Wells Fargo isn't accepting my payments anymore, I don't understand, but guess what? I'm making $756 a month off of it and I need you to help me refinance Wells Fargo's money out of it. And what happens with that is it's kind of interesting because you don't own the property, so you can't refinance, right? Because you sold it on a wraparound mortgage. When you sell with a wraparound mortgage, the owner of the property is the person that paid you 10% down and is paying you a mortgage. They mm -hmm. own the house, you're just the bank. So you can't go out and refinance that mortgage because to refinance, you've gotta be able to put up your asset as collateral. In other words, you have to say, give me $70,000 and in return, if I don't pay you back, you get to take this house from me. Well, the way that you can do it in this situation, you've got that crazy seller, you've got this situation where something's going wrong with the bank down here is you call one of your private lenders and you say, are you willing to, to refinance me out of this? And then you do what's called a collateral assignment. So I don't have a house as an asset to give you as collateral. I can't say that if I don't pay you back, you're going to get this house back. But what I can say is if I don't pay you like I'm supposed to, then you get this note for $756 a month. That's my collateral. My collateral is the fact that I have a mortgage with this person, a wraparound mortgage, and if I don't pay, my, my interest in that mortgage will go to you and you get that payment instead. Yes, sir. But Grant, you're this gajillionaire investor. Why don't you just use your own money out of your wallet to pay it off? Right, so, can't, so there's a lot of answers to that. A, I like spending my money. I don't like spending my money on 
things that, uh, you know, other than being able to spend it on things that I, I want. B, I've got a lot of private money behind me. There's a lot of people who don't have the ability to create mortgages and to create op opportunities in uh, real estate, but they've got a lot of capital. Some of you watching may be in that situation. And so I've got a lot of people, and I would encourage you to reach out as well, another subtle plug, if that's you and, and who have the capital but don't have the ability to put it in real estate. So what I'm doing is I'm leveraging. I like to buy assets. I like to buy cash flow. I like to buy equity. I like to buy everything that I'm getting with my net worth without having to spend my own money, right? And if I've got the right terms for it, like, yeah, if somebody's asking me for 17%, yeah, I'm just going to spend my own money on that. Right. But if, some, if I'm getting 8% for 20 years, which is what I'm typically getting, or 8% at 10 years or whatever that might be, I mean, it's different per lender, uh, that makes sense for me to just leverage that capital and use my cash for other things that might make me more money in the long run. Yeah. My cash on cash returns become much larger when I'm spending less of my cash and still getting the whole deal. And the reason I, I, I gave you that softball is because all, all the time you're, well, if you've got all this money, why, why do you need a lender? Why are you using private money? Why do you get a hard money lender? It's like, it's that ability to leverage what you've already built right. because Say you are a gajillionaire. Right. Well, even if you're a gajillionaire, eventually, if you're spending all your money on deals, you can't do any more deals. I was about to say that. No matter how much money you have, you're going to run out. I've got almost $10 million in debt, and I've only been doing this deal or doing this thing for six years, right? right. I, I did not have $10 million sitting there that I could just spend on deals. Right. So, uh, so yeah, no matter how much money you have, you're going to run out. No matter how much private money I have, I'm going to run out. There's just so much business out there to work on. Do we have any other questions, Daniel? I've got several questions, but I'd like to touch base on the, the crazy seller calling the bank up situation and the yeah. bank calling the note due. This is not my response, but this was a response I saw out of one of the Houston Facebook groups, and I loved the way he said it. And I'd like your feedback on that. He's like, you know, I've got the property subject to, I've got the asset, I've done a massive remodel to it, and when the bank calls me up and says, hey, we're going to call the note due, his response to the bank was, great, I, I go for it, call the note due. Uh, when you do that, I'm going to go ahead and remove all of the capital that I've invested in the property back out, which would include the granite countertops, the cabinets, the bathrooms, the kitchens, the wallpaper, everything else that I invested into that house, when you go to foreclose on it, will be removed, so that way you don't have to worry about all the money I've put into that property for you. And if you'd like to go ahead and move forward, go ahead and move forward. What is your thought process on that response to the bank? I think that's a really interesting response. And from my understanding, that worked for him too, yes. right? Um, I've never tried that. I mean, that's a pretty hardball stance to take on the bank, and I've never tried that one before. And from my understanding, you also had to move up like several ranks in the, mm -hmm. you know, you're not talking to the peon that answers the phone. You're saying like, let me talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about and having, I haven't tried that. Um, but it's interesting. And that Can you could explain be a, really... a little bit what that tactic is and why the bank would be afraid if you started talking like that? Yeah, so the reason why the bank is afraid is again, they're not Caldwell Banker, they're Bank of America. They want to make money. And the unknown of, because if they take that property back through foreclosure, a lot of things happen, okay? A lot of stuff happens behind the scenes. A, that costs them money in legal fees, et cetera. Costs them to uh, uh, have that house sitting there. And then also, when they put that house up on the market to try and sell it, how much are they gonna be able to get for that asset on the open market? Well, you tell me, how much is a house whose ARV is 150 gonna get if there's no kitchen in it, right? If you take all the kitchen cabinetry out and there's no flooring and you remove the roof or what, you know, whatever right. that is, they're not getting squat for it. And the thing with bank lending is that when they do that loan on, the, uh, on your house, with bank lending, it's not made up money right? Because you're buying the house from the seller, okay? So like, let's say you've got your seller over here and they want uh, to sell the house for 100K. And through the traditional financing model, you're going to go to uh, Bank of America, make it look like a jail here, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to go to Bank of America and ask them for a loan for that property. They're going to say, cool, give me you know, whatever, three and a half percent down if you're doing an FHA loan. So they're only getting three and a half thousand dollars uh, actual cash coming in. And guess what? They're actually giving this seller a hundred thousand dollars of real cash. That cash is leaving this account and going to that person. That's actual money leaving. Okay. It's not made up money like with a wraparound mortgage where you're like, oh, you just owe me a hundred. Why not? We're just making up money. We, we're, we sometimes we'll joke around that we print money as a business. That's what we do is because we just make up a number and then people owe it to us. But here they're actually putting that money on the line. So if they take a house back, they have to make that hundred thousand dollars back 
for it to do any, just to break even for them. And if you've threatened to make that asset not worth $100,000 anymore, they're talking about taking a loss and that hurts. And guess what? When they do call a due on sale clause, that's also classified as a foreclosure at that point in time. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, uh, punish banks on their lending power in a multiple of however much they're having to foreclose on people because it shows that the bank was doing irresponsible lending. So I think it's eight, and I can't remember. I think it's eight times. If you know the answer to that, uh, uh, comment in uh, right now. But uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac say, hey, if you foreclosed on $100,000 worth of loans last year, we are not going to back up $800,000 worth of loans this coming year. So they've got to really consider, are we going to make enough cash by taking this property back and reselling it for it to make sense in our asset management? Or does it just make more sense for us to sit here and continue getting uh, payments made on time from this investor, even though we could call the due on sale clause. Does that answer what you're looking for? I will say, if you're like me and all this is way up here, give us a like. <laughs> <laughs> or give me a like. You know, here's the thing, guys. Or hashtag Ryan's an idiot. Those of you who are watching, I want to be very clear with this, that that's my, that's my job here. My job is to give you real information. My job is to get into the nitty gritties. And if you like that, I do want to see you like this. I do want to see you share this. I do want to see you go like, you know, at CCF Mentors because that's what we're about here. There's a lot of places that you can get fluff. There's a lot of places that somebody's going to pat you on the rear and tell you you're going to be a millionaire in five just years. Just do it. Just do it today. You just got to make the decision today. Do the grind. Do the work. But here's the thing. To know those things, to know how to make that money, yes, you can be a millionaire in five years. That's very common. Five to seven years is a very common time to become a millionaire in real estate but it's the basis of knowledge that gets you there. And that's what our motto is here through Papelio and through creativecashflow.com is we wanna get that to you. So encourage us, give us questions, let us know what's going on, like these videos, share these videos. Let me know what other topics you would like me to go into in detail so that you can know what the heck is going on here. I really do want you to comment and say stuff that you might be interested in learning about because I need more topics to talk about on a weekly basis and that'll help me too. So. Daniel, he's way better at this than we are. Yeah. Oh yeah, by far a <laughs> rock star. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. So yeah, I'd love to get your interaction with this. Join in. We want it. We want this to be a two-way street because this is me talking to a camera, but it is really me talking to you. And we need it. This is like our virtual REI club right here. And we need to make sure that we're getting proper communication channels back and forth. So I got some more questions. Please hit me here. with them. A uh, real quick one you should be able to knock out from Royce here. Um, he's been having a problem with the property that he took over subject to with a note being called due on it. Uh, but he's asking here, how do you stop mail from being forwarded to the seller from old address from the bank? So the bank is sending mail to the old address and it's getting forwarded to his seller. You know, yeah, so uh, most banks, you can change that online. You can change where their communication is going online. So uh, one of the other things I do whenever I'm closing with my, my sellers is I get their online login for the bank. And if they don't have one, we create one with them uh, before closing so that we have the ability to log online and get that done. And then otherwise, if you've got your power of attorney filled in with the uh, seller, you've got that filed with the bank, you could call the bank and have them change the address to your office address. Okay. What else do we have? I've got another statement here from Russian Jaime. Right. Uh, if they call it due, can you just make an agreement with an attorney to cure the defect and deed it back to the original owner for a couple of days and report that to the bank, then deed it back to yourself again? That is, that is a legitimate way to go about doing it. Um, one of the ways, so, uh, you know, I have to brag on Scott Horn here for a minute because that's, uh, that's when I talk about my office, that's where, you know, I office with Scott, I'm partners with Scott. And when I call on these 30 years of experience, it's those numbers that I'm calling on. Of those uh, due on sale clauses that I mentioned having been called, none of them actually went to a point where somebody was having to actually get foreclosed on because of strategies like that. Deed the property back over to the seller, show the bank that it's been cured in the way that it should be cured, it's back to the seller. And then at that point in time, after that has happened, what we've done in the past is employed the trust at that point, okay? Then you can wait a little bit, sign some agreements with the seller, sign some agreements with the buyer, wait a little bit, then transfer into the trust, and then transfer the beneficial in, uh, interest of that trust into your uh, buyer's name. But it's very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, important that while you're closing with your seller, while you're closing with your buyer, you're explaining to them that this could happen and that if we ever have something like this pop up, the most important thing is for the communication channels to be open because we should be able to fix it as long as everybody's acting at the same time. We tell them it's gonna be all hands on deck. We just gotta be ready to move, but we'll do everything we can to keep it yeah, from being bad. Yeah, because immediately I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to that crazy stupid person 
where they're like, well, I ain't signed nothing unless you pay me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they went into that voice, but I'm just assuming. Right. You know, what do you do in a situation like that? And, that, and you've got to an, uh, an, an, analyze. You've got to analyze that on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Is it worth, man, why does my accent ease it? Is it worth paying them that money to just not deal with it? Or is it better to go the private money route and mm -hmm. do a collateral assignment? Or is it better to just say, you know what? Screw you. Both your buyer and your seller are being dumb. Deal with the consequences. I wouldn't recommend that, but it's your it's Burn your Burn it down. Burn it no, down. I mean, not literally, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, screw it. So uh, so that's your that's your per asset, per situation call to make for yourself. Okay. I forgot where we ended. Yes. And we started going on, on, on we questions. Did. Yeah. But I know we're talking about wraps. <laughs> right. So the wraparound, and I'm going to actually push this off to uh, future lessons okay. as we start talking about, because we've gotten some really good interactions here and we've gotten some great questions. So I do, I do want that to keep up. But I think that we've gotten a good point across for you guys that through a wraparound mortgage, you do have the capability of making a lot of money uh, without having the liabilities that you would from putting your own cash on the table. Right. And, and, and just to summarize and break it down for the stupid people like myself, you know, you got the debt and then you got the owner finance mm -hmm. and then you got the meat in between and the meat in between is you. That's all your profit right there. The hashtag <laughs> rap <laughs> donut. The hashtag rap donut. Yes. Yes. That is it. Excellent. But anyway, but yeah, so you've got the, the debt and then you got the owner finance, but then you got the meat in between. Right. That, that's your, that's your a happy place. This is your happy place. This is where you make your, all your money. And guys, I love this strategy. It's a really good strategy for you to, again, uh, if you're doing things right, if you've got your paperwork set up the right way, you've got dang near zero liability on this, on this loan. Uh, using an attorney like Matthew Acock, using an attorney like uh, Scott Horn, that's going to be your key to getting these things, the, these things done the right way. Did you see things? Things, these things done the right way. And, uh, and getting the proper training, guys. Looking at something like this, you know, here's the thing, as we talked about, we're, our, our goal is to give you meat. Our goal is to give you the real inside information and not just be the fluff that pats you on the rear and makes you feel good about what you're doing. That's not what we're here to do. But we are here to educate, and we do have things to offer that are gonna help you out with that, mm -hmm. right? Do and, and real quick, we are wrapping up, <laughs> get it? Um, subtle, any window or whatever. Good. But I know, right? But since we are wrapping up, you still have an opportunity to jump some questions in. So, so put them out there. L let us hear what you got to say. And it looks like Daniel's over here with a question. I love this question because I get mad at the, uh, the gurus that come around and say, you don't need any money to do subject to. I disagree with that. And this question is, would you say that you have to have some capital to do this? I knew it was going to have to be a good question because I'm sitting here talking to the camera and I hear Daniel in the corner. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. Here's my answer to that. I bought my first 50 to 60 houses with literally without reaching into my own back pocket for a single dollar. Okay. You can get into owner financing and subject to without any capital capital. I to stay in the business, you've got to have some capital lined up. So here's what I recommend for you. If you don't have money, if you don't have money, you can still make this happen. But when you get that 10% down payment, set that money to the side and do not touch it because that $7,000 is going to be what allows you to debt service your property if your buyer stops paying for a couple of months and you've got to foreclose. And, and on that note, I've known Grant for several years now and he's been very vocal in his, uh, at least the, I'm, I'm not gonna say your first few years in mm -hmm. the business, mm -hmm. but the first few years I've known you in the business has, I fully anticipate and my wife fully anticipates us being poor as whatever because every dollar I make is going towards the future, mm -hmm. not for right now. Right, and, and that, would, that was always my stance. And you know, fortunately, God's been very good to me. These last couple few years, I've made a lot of cash on top of the net worth and those kinds of things. And now he's got like this big ass house. <laughs> it's true, and I bought it sub too. Um, so, but, the, but again, to that point, 
I poured everything into the business at the beginning. You know, we didn't, we really didn't pull much out. I, I matched uh, my first year. I made like 55 grand or something like that, that I actually brought home and the rest went in the business and we've been going up since then, but you don't have to have capital to get in. You can buy houses through networking. You can buy houses in, in various different ways with owner financing. It's one of the beautiful things about this that makes it competitive with a strategy like wholesaling where you don't have to have capital, but you got to understand there's things like uh, marketing. You know, you've got to, you've got to really understand that you've got to, if you're not good at marketing to people, like for instance, I'm good at marketing to people. I can go to REI clubs, let them know what I stand for, get deals coming from other people who are sending out the marketing. <laughs> and you know, and, and but there's phraseologies, there's things to say, right? And that's one of the things I talk about with my like students. Like not what I just said. Yeah, not Don't just like, so sexy lady, how about you give me some of them deals, huh? That, no, don't that's do not that. how you go about doing that. So, uh, but there are ways to go about doing that. That is one of the things that I talk about with my students and, and, and helping you to where you can buy houses without any money. But if you want to stay in the business, you've got to set that capital aside to be ready for the rainy days. Right. Mr. Moore. My input on that's a little different, but I would love to hear it. Go let's for it. hear Mr. Moore, Daniel Moore. You don't have to have money to make a subject to deal work but you need to at least be backed by capital because you are making an obligation to that seller that if things go south, you are that barrier in between. Mm -hmm. And if you do your very first deal, like let's say, uh, like Royce just did his very first one, it's going south real fast. Well, if he did that deal without any money or without any money backing him, then what we would end up with is a problem where you're now obligated to a seller and you're not um, able to perform. So you either need to be backed by capital or have capital. And that's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, grant scenario, I believe that you really quickly were able to find capital partners to help you out. So right. you were able to get into this business and scale up really fast. Sure. But, you know. And, I, and I'm glad that you draw, uh, draw that, opinion, or that opinion out because I agree with you. I, I do. I, and uh, part of the basis of why, and you know, and, and, and it's dangerous for me because I don't want this to be like, oh, it's just so easy. It's just so easy. It's not so easy. There's a lot of complicated things that go into this, as you see. Uh, however, that, like, like I said, if you're going to sell it with owner financing, you have a down payment. You've got some money backed up that's going to last you for a little while. But if you've got a deal, a performing deal, and you've done it the way that I've taught you how to do it, that deal is shoppable to private money. And you can reach out to somebody like me. You can reach out to somebody in the business. Go to these REI clubs and check with other people that do have capital or who have done this business and say, like, look, I've got this deal and uh, I've run into a situation where my buyer's not paying it anymore. Would you come in as a capital partner on this? I'll give you 50% of the deal if you can if you can cover my debt service while we're reloading it and uh, doing the rehab on it. And of course, you're giving up 50% of your deal, but there is nothing more important than doing what you say you're going to do and taking care of your seller. If you're going to look at your seller in the eyes and you're going to say, yes, seller, let me take over on your mortgage and I will become the owner of the house and I'm going to get all of the capital benefits of owning your house. But guess what? You're going to own the debt. And so and if a foreclosure happens, it's going to affect your credit, not mine. Sign right here and they sign that piece of paper, you better do everything in your freaking power to make sure that that never goes to foreclosure because they have trusted you with that asset and you have to do the right thing. There is nothing more important than doing the right thing. Proper disclosure, letting them know about due on sale clause, letting them know what you're going to be doing with the property, the fact that you're going to make a lot of money on it. But there's right ways and wrong ways to phrase that to them. But either way, they've trusted you with that. Mm -hmm. and, and there are too many snakes in this business, and that's not us. And we are not there to take advantage of people. Yeah, two quick points. Uh, first, I just want to give a quick shout out to Tim Harridge because uh, like the, the years I work with him, his one of his biggest, uh, um, I don't know, missions, mission statements or whatever, is if you're going to sign the contract, you're going to close on the contract. Hopefully, you're going to sign the contract and, and get rid of it and make some money. But if you if you sign the dotted line, even if you're going to lose money, you close because your name is, is stronger than, you know, the, the, um, the, the, I forgot. What am I, what am I trying to say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, you know, your, your word is your bond type of yeah. thing. If you're going to yeah. sign, sign the agreement, you know, live up to it. You know, there's two real estate is small world It's a small world. So if you screw up, people are going to know about it. Right. And if you're a title company, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, and my second point on that is, you know, this little disagreement between Daniel and, 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 and uh, uh, what's your name? It's not even a disagreement. Well, we I mean, agree, I, yeah. my difference of opinion. Yeah. But uh, uh, Daniel and It's not, a, it's not opinion even either. Either. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We both agree. <laughs> anyway, this one. My, my point being is, you know, there's different strategies, there's differences of opinions, and that's why it's important to network. That's, imp that's mm. why it's important to get out there and do the masterminds and actually talk a strategy and, and actually step up your game and, and, and watch these videos and join in the conversation and right. et cetera, et cetera. And fine, Ryan's an idiot. 
<laughs> your name is your reputation. Is that what you're All right, so Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've got some more questions here just Please. to wrap up on what Grant just said. I mean, that is one of the main reasons why I love Grant so much is because the way he teaches it is the right way. Uh, one of the biggest points I was trying to make is there are so many uh, fly-by-night traveling salesman gurus trying to get $1,000 out of your back pocket that are going to teach you that you don't need any money to do this business and that you need to just go out there and grab as much as you can and do, the, do a lot of shady stuff. And that is not what Grant's about and that is not what Grant teaches. And I like the fact that he really comes in and he's the guy that mentored me through Subject 2. Uh, he's the one, you're the one that taught me everything I know about Subject 2. So he's my go-to Subject 2 guy. I've got several questions here. This one's going to be a long question. I don't know if we need to touch base on it or just tell the person to hit rewind. But Henry asked, <laughs> came in late. Real quick, what are the basic steps from contracting seller to wrapped sell to owner finance buyer? That is like, that's like a whole three-day class. So. I, I do want to point out real quick, Henry, you come in like every episode. In every episode, you're like, hey, by the way, can you just recap what you just did for the past 45 minutes? I love you, buddy. But uh. So I got but another no. question And you know, here. the funny thing is, is Henry, you just bought my course. Go watch the videos. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that come through. So yeah, the 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 question from Henry is contracting the seller, wrapping owner financing. Uh, that is something I teach in my academy. I'll use that as a nice little little segue here. I do have an online academy through CreativeCashflow.com that you can go purchase, and there's chapter after chapter after chapter that walks through every start to finish step. It was sponsored by these guys at Propelio because they are so. Uh, dedicated to getting real information Only in front 999. of people. Right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, getting real information in front of people for that kind of stuff. So encourage them. Go like their page, follow their page. Go to propelio.com. Most of all, dude, you've got lead lists that are amazing there. You've got a CRM that he refuses to talk about, but I think is great. You've got the ability to get MLS comps out there. It's an amazing piece of software for 99% of the people that are watching this video. So go check out propelio.com. They do have something to offer you that is amazing. Uh, and encourage him for to keep continuing to do things like this and get real information out in front of you. He's way better at this. He is, he's, <laughs> Grant's a rock star and absolutely like his class that he put together, that 36 hours of just straight video training was absolute gold. I mean, I know for myself personally with you, I had to bring you quite a bit of capital through equity that uh, to get that training from you. So if I could rewind it back and just drop that and grab those videos, I would have definitely done that because you got at least 20 grand out oh, of yeah, me I on got, that. I got good money out of it. We both got good money <laughs> out of it. We both got good money out of that. So moving forward, I got another question here from Jaime. If you, he always gets creative with this stuff. I do, I like that. If you, have, if you have an offer, if you offer a lease option and you convert it into owner financed with the same buyer, is that a way to avoid using an RMLO? Yeah, and that's a really good question. And so to avoid doing another 45 minute class, I will give the short answer of saying no. Uh, Dodd-Frank is what determines what the legalities are between lending and, and what can happen. And I wanna be clear that Dodd-Frank, people refer to Dodd-Frank as though it's a singular unit of laws. It's not, it's, it's a unit, uh, or it's a, uh, a collection of amendment to other laws like RESPA and TILA and all that kind of stuff. In Dodd-Frank, it defines a owner financed, or I'm sorry, it defines a mortgage as any time, essentially, you are negotiating terms for somebody to pay you money to own the house, okay? And they make it very broad intentionally to keep us from being able to get creative and get around that. And even inside of that, there are actually sections of Dodd-Frank that reference, if you do something to get around this law, then we still get to, we still get to hit you with this law. So if that goes to court and somebody says, well, you did this lease option and immediately turned it into a, an owner financed mortgage, how did you negotiate the terms of that lease option and when did you do that? Well, it would have been from the beginning, and that's what triggers the do on, or I'm sorry, that's what triggers the uh, Dodd Frank regulations. What's a RMLPCO? An RMLO is a realist, uh, I'm sorry, a residential mortgage loan originator. <laughs> um, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I founded Texas Pride Lending several years ago. I built that to be the largest RMLO service in the nation and then sold it. Uh, so I'm no longer doing the RMLO services anymore, but the RMLO is the, the, uh, uh, the position that was created by Dodd-Frank. It used to, I mean, it's basic, it's like saying loan officer. It's the new word for loan officer. It's what Dodd-Frank says has to be the licensed individual, uh, licensed by the state and by the, uh, by the nation. Uh, that's not the right word, nation, country, whatever. America, Mar licensed by America, um, to be able to originate an owner financed mortgage. And that is to be the person that actually uh, uh, negotiates the terms, collects the loan application, that kind of stuff. And, and I joke about laid up the softball. The reality is there's so much information about real estate 
that there really is no stupid question, and I, I kind of joke about that. But I mean, even if you're advanced, there's some aspects of real estate that you just, huh? Right. You know, so it is what it is. Right. All right, so I've got a uh, statement here from Matt Acock. He's coming in Friday, you said? He's coming so, in Friday to teach us about the whole tax. So if you have some one. questions about the changes in the tax law, Matt Acock's coming in on Friday to talk about that. He is a lawyer. He is very, very sharp. I mean, he's closing a lot of deals for investors here in DFW, so check out Matt Acock. But uh, he said, you know, highlighting disclosures of purpose slash goals is very important. Great point, Grant. Thanks, and then. Matt. Um, Let's see if I got any other questions. Questions here. I've got a statement here from Thomas uh, saying, you know, 36 hours of great deep content. This is surface level. So he's mentioning your course that you've got there at CreativeCashflow.com. Right. He's another one of those students that's out there um, watching. He goes it. deep. So I mean, I think that's about it. So if anybody else has any final questions, they better jump on real quick. But I think we're wrapping up here. And on that note, uh, if you do need MLS comps, if you need access to comps, check out www.propelio.com. Uh, if you are in the in the market for lead lists, uh, we have tons of lead lists that probably Grant and Daniel are both at selling that uh, or pitching what we do there. Um, so if you've never even looked at or heard of what actually Propelio does, I know we do all these videos, but the reality is we do a lot more than just these videos. Uh, so you know, poke around our webpage, poke around our Facebook to find out what it is we actually do, and that's comps and that's leads. And, and coming soon, we're going to be releasing websites. Uh, if you are in the San Antonio market, uh, we actually have an event on February 26th, that's a Monday, uh, where we're actually going to host uh, the San Antonio REI Meetup. Uh, we've got uh, several sponsors, several other vendors. Uh, Daniel's going to be teaching foreclosures. Mr. Stevens going to be talking about uh, private capital. I also have uh, seven other presentations that I haven't picked yet. Um, I'm still kind of weeding through. Grant might be teaching. We'll see. Um, he hasn't pitched it yet. He and tries you know to what? act like he's going to take it away from me. Hell we yeah. both know. If it ain't good, it ain't good. Uh, but he <laughs> is going to be in there uh, sponsoring as well. Uh, so we've got a lot of things kicking around here. We do, if you're in the Dallas market, we do a, a monthly mastermind. Uh, this month is Valentine's Day, so I might need to change that. Um, details to follow. But ultimately, if you enjoy what we do here at Propelio for the Propelio TV, give us a like, give us a share. Uh, if you haven't liked our page, what the hell, guys? Come on, <laughs> like the damn page. Right. Um, if you haven't liked Creative Cash Flow, give him a like. Um, you know, basically, I'm up here. I'm 30 something, seven? I'm 37 years old, desperate for likes and shares because my ego <laughs> needs it. Anyway. <laughs> Any Thanks final for, thoughts? No, I just wanted to thank you guys for being here. And I, if you're watching this video, please comment different things that you want to learn about and get involved in the future ones. Come back to me and let other guys know if you're out there and, and learning. This is a place to get the meaty details of how stuff is working. Every Wednesday at 11, come watch me. And then if you've got more you want to learn about, uh, obviously I've got the Academy and the personal mentoring, but I love having you guys here. It's really encouraging seeing all these questions. Right. And uh, yeah. And so next week, episode 11 of Grant Teach Me Something. Hey, until then, we'll see you there.